I'm going to start the recording now. All right, and welcome to our first Wild About Bats Project Wild webinar. We're so glad you could join us, and we're so happy to have our guests uh, present some incredible information and share their experiences that they've had with um, bat education and the things that they've done. So for those of you that don't know, I think in the registration, we asked um, if people were familiar with Project Wild, um, but I'll just tell you a little bit about Project Wild. Um, Project Wild is an interdisciplinary pre-K through 12 conservation education program emphasizing wildlife. And our goal is to assist learners of any age in developing awareness, knowledge, skills, and commitment resulting in informed decisions, responsible behavior, and constructive actions concerning wildlife and the environment. We have a national network of state sponsors that provides professional development for formal and non-formal educators. We emphasize a hands-on investigative approach to learning that engages students with the world around them, connecting them to conservation careers and participating in STEM activities. Um, our partner today is Wildlife Acoustics and Wildlife Acoustics is the leading provider of bioacoustic, bioacoustics monitoring technology for scientists, researchers and government agencies worldwide. Its users monitor a wide range of wildlife from bats, birds, frogs, insects, fish, whales, elephants, and even rhinos. Wildlife Acoustics mission is to design and develop the most innovative, easy to use, and economical bioacoustics monitoring and analysis tools available today. Its song meter recorders, which you will see today, are deployed in more than 70 countries and on all continents, including Antarctica. And the echo meter touch handheld is a bat detector that um, our main presenter Maria uses has become a, a favorite among professionals, hobbyists, educators, students and citizen scientists, and certainly myself <laughs> worldwide. It's real time monitoring high quality recording capabilities, um, beautiful full color spectrograms and bat auto ID features makes evening batting adventures, engaging, shareable, and memorable. And the Echo Meter Touch is compatible, compatible with Apple, iOS, and Android devices. And you can find out more about that at wildlifeacoustics.com. And we'll certainly have links to that on our website. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as I mentioned, this is being recorded and we will post a link to the recording on the Project Well webpage. All of you will get a note with the link to that. Um, and so we'll send that email out to everyone who is registered for that link. All right, um, let's see who you're talking to. You're talking to myself. My name is Elena Takaki. Um, I'm the director of Project Wild. Kelly Reynolds and Mark Lefebvre are also monitor, helping to monitor the chat. Um, so you might see their names frequently as well, especially in the chat uh, box. So an overview of what we're doing today. Um, Maria Brown is gonna talk about bat biology and ecology. And she just came back from a trip um, from South America. Um, and uh, she has some amazing uh, stories to tell you, to share with you. Jen Dennison is our Project Wild coordinator in Ohio, and she did a Wild About Bats. She has done several Wild About Bats workshops there. And then also Lori Adams um, has done some Wild About Bats workshops in Idaho, and she's going to show you how innovative ways of how she's shared bat education. And then at the end, um, we'll have an opportunity for you to talk with all of our speakers and ask them questions. Okay, so um, this always makes me nervous, but I'm trying, <laughs> I will try to implement a poll for you all to respond. So if you are on a computer, um, let's see, we want to know a little bit about you. Um, okay, so who are you? 
So um, if you could please answer the questions, uh, what do you consider yourself? Um, a formal educator, a non-formal educator? I'm gonna give people a few, few more seconds to respond, maybe another 15 seconds. And then we also want to know where you're from. So are you calling in um, outside of the USA or where in the US in the United States you're dialing in from? So I'll give you about another 15 seconds. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll. And let's see. So you can see um, we have people who identify as non-formal educators, a good percentage there, or non-formal educators at a state agency. Um, but we also have some classroom teachers and um, let's see, elementary teachers and high school teachers. Um, scientists, a few scientists at a nonprofit or for-profit agency. Um, and where you all are located, looks like many of you are calling in um, from the Northeast. Okay, not so many from the Northwest, could be a time issue. Okay, great. All right, so thanks for that, folks. It's always good to know who we have online with us. And I'm having trouble advancing the slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, Maria Brown. And um, Maria has been an educator in the Sayville School District for the past 20 years. Prior to her teaching career, she was a senior environmental scientist for nearly 12 years in industry. And she's also a certified geospatial analyst professional and has been teaching courses in GIS at Stony Brook University since 2011. Maria began studying bats in Costa Rica in 2007 with her high school students and has continued to study bat biodiversity and distribution with her most recent work in the Peruvian Amazon and on Long Island, New York. She is a member of the Global Bat Taxonomy Working Group where she works on spatial data resolution issues for bat distribution maps. She enjoys uh, getting her community and her students excited about bat conservation and uses wildlife acoustics echo meter touch to captivate audiences of all ages. So Maria, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'd like to thank Project Wild and Wildlife Acoustics for inviting me to participate. Uh, I guess just tell me when I can share. Uh, it's always such a great day when I can share my love of bats with others, educators, community members, students, and uh, I really look forward to doing this today. So, Thanks, Maria. You should be able to share your screen. Okay. So, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so let's begin about wild about bats. Okay, let's see if my technology is working. There we go. All right, so very quickly, I'm going to tell you about how it all started in the beginning, uh, and then uh, with my high school students, and then um, an introduction to bats and some misconceptions, some of their ecosystem services, uh, along with human impacts and climate change going to show you how we ca catch bats and then how we do the bioacoustical monitoring with the song meters uh, in education to do educational outreach and also some citizen science. 
Uh, I've provided some educational resources at the end, and I'll introduce a new application developed with my students called BATMAP Long Island for a citizen science project. So in the beginning, in 2005, I was actually teaching AP Environmental Science and decided to take my students to Costa Rica since it was the model for sustainability. And so we started going into the jungles, places that were not in their comfort zone. And it was a combination of AP Environmental, Biology, Economics, and Spanish as an enrichment program. And uh, so this is my first class here, but I will point out that this is my 11-year-old daughter who has been my best field buddy and bat scientist ever since. So by 2007, we ended up at a place called Proyecto Campanario, and that's down in the Osa Peninsula of Costa Rica uh, and within walking distance of Corcovado National Park, which is the largest national park in, Corcovado, uh, uh, in Costa Rica. Uh, and so there is a, a link here uh, and we can share my, my PowerPoint, uh, but visit it. It's an amazing place. And so as you can see this beautiful place, we arrived, it was almost like Gilligan's Island. We arrived on a boat, had to hop out of the boat and carry our luggage above our heads and come to the shoreline. And this is the biological field station sitting right on the Pacific Ocean. And so <clears throat> that afternoon, as we were getting our orientation, um, Nancy Aiken, the owner, she uh, announced to us that we would be visiting the Bat Cave that evening. So we, uh, we did go to the Bat Cave and everybody was super excited. Uh, but before I tell you about the bats that were in that Bat Cave, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about bats. So what are they? They basically come from the superorder uh, Laurasiatheria. And they are close, most closely related to pangolins, which are from the same superorder. They're from Animalia, Kingdom Animalia, just as we are, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia. But the order is Chiroptera. And Chiroptera means hand wing, which I will show you in just a few minutes. Uh, and then the suborders are Mega Chiroptera, which is displayed here, such as the giant fox, the giant flying foxes, which are old world bats. And they can have wingspans as large as six feet, so you commonly see them in Australia. And then microchiroptera, like we have here in North America, uh, the smallest one being the bumblebee bat found in Thailand. Uh, and these are, these are very small bats. Bats have a global extent everywhere on Earth except for the North and South Poles. So uh, basically, they can find food everywhere else except where there is permanent ice. So when we look at this order Chiroptera, we look at the homology. And so remember I said hand wing is what Chiroptera means. And so we can compare our human arm to the wing of a bat. And so the shoulders are here. And as you move down, you have the elbows. And as you move down further, the wrist of the bat is here compared to our wrist. And then this is their thumb. So our thumb is here. And then you have the forefinger, the middle finger, the ring finger, and the pinky. And so it matches right up to our hands. So bats are like having wings with jazz hands. When I just uh, was in uh, the Peruvian Amazon, we caught this beautiful bat, uh, Teropteryx leucoptera, and it's one of the rare bats that actually has clear wings. So we put the wing over this bird book just so you can see right through it. But what I want to point out here is that here is the um, elbow, here is the wrist, the thumb, the forefinger, the middle finger, the ring finger, and the pinky. So unfortunately, lots of people are always coming up to me going, that's going to fly into my hair. So they get, they get a bad rap. And this all started pretty much with Bram Stoker's Dracula providing that imagery of evil with nocturnal bat-like behavior and association of bats with blood. But honestly, they're really not interested in, in our blood or blood in general. 
So blind as a bat is another misconception. And we know that there are insect eating bats that search through, uh, use sonar to search for their food. And this is called echolocation. So the bat will send out a signal, it'll find its prey and it will receive the uh, signal back from the prey. And so it was always thought that these bats that have very small eyes on the sides of their head, that they don't really see well at all. But that's not true. These bats actually have rods, which is black and white, and it's for night vision. Unlike Rodriguez fruit bats and other fruit bats that have their eyes in the front of their head, they can see in, in uh, color. So they have cones and rods just like we do. And the Max Planck Institute uh, put out a paper on this uh, back in 2017. So some other common misconceptions, uh, people always come up to me and say, oh, bats are like flying mice. And I think that comes from the German word Fledermaus, which means flying mouse, but they're not. They're uh, related to the pangolins. People come up to me and say, oh, do you touch, do you touch bats? You shouldn't touch bats. You're going to get rabies. Well, you shouldn't touch bats without a rabies shot. But if you do a fact check, actually less than all bat, all, less than 1% of all bats actually have rabies. And you stand a far better chance of being hit by lightning than you do of being bitten by a bat that has rabies. Other people come up to me and say, oh, bats are dirty. When you handle them, they're dirty. I'm like, no, they're actually really clean. And if you do a fact check, they actually groom themselves in the same way a cat does. And you can see this beautiful fruit bat here is actually cleaning off its wing. Um, here's another one. I think we have a poll for this one. Lots of people are like, bats, they're hideous. So the audience says, I don't know what the audience says, but if you look at those bats, I don't really think they're hideous, but I know I'm very biased. And then again, people are always saying, you know, bats attack humans, they're going to drink your blood, especially in Central and South America. They fear um, the vampire bats. And so there are three vampire bats. They're among the smallest bats in Central and South America. And they have a nasty bite, um, but they're not interested in us. They're interested in domestic livestock and birds. And uh, vampire bats are actually really cool. When they go, when they, they actually are the only ones that move quadrupedally, so they'll creep up on their prey. And on their tongue, they have an, an anesthetic on their tongue. So they'll lick the, the point of their prey where they're going to insert their teeth. And it numbs the prey. So if you're a cow or a pig or a bird, you're, you're not going to feel anything. And then they, they kind of puncture a vein or an artery with uh, their teeth. And then the, the, the um, chemical that's on their tongue also acts as an anticoagulant. So the blood just kind of drips for about 30 minutes. And so they just lap up blood um, very, you know, for about 30 minutes. Uh, but for a cow and a, and a pig, they're not going to do all that much damage. Small birds, they could bleed out a bird. But again, they're not interested in us. They're not interested in drinking human blood. So, uh, and out of all the species of bats, there's only three that are vampire bats. So let's go back to the bat cave in Costa Rica. That bat cave was made up of three different species of bats that are a part of the New World bats in a family called Marmupidae. And they're known as the mustache bats. And if you notice here, just underneath the nose and above the lip, they have this little mustache along with these little vesicles that help for sensory and help for echolocation. And all bats have different shaped ears in order to receive their waves back from their prey. So this is, these are insect eating bats. So they need to be able to hear, hear back what, what they're sending their signal out for. There's about 11 species total and uh, based on new genetics information, a lot of these species are being put into what's called species complexes. They range throughout South and Central America and sometimes can even reach the Southern US. They roost in caves and they're hyper-specialized echolocators. So these are the three different species of bats that live in that cave. 
Pteranotus parnellii, which is now known as Mesoamericanus because parnellii is only in the Caribbean, and this is in southern Costa Rica. Then we have Pteranotus gymnotus, which is the big naked backed bat. Take a look at the back of this bat. It has absolutely no hair. And it's really funky looking when you catch one. And then Pteranotus personatus, it looks a lot like Carnelli mesoamericanus, but it's much smaller. So these are the three bats that we were introduced to on that night. And it was really fascinating to be able to see 40,000 bats emerge at dusk, and then also um, to be able to capture them in mist nets. So most biological stations, if they're doing bat work, they have permits to do that. Uh, this one had all of the equipment and we were able to participate in that. And so we learned a lot that night about why we should really care about bats. And so most bats, especially the insectivorous ones, are going to help with common tropical agricultural pests. But also here in the Northeast, we deal a lot with mosquitoes and the fact that mosquitoes carry West Nile virus. So bats are really great at eating lots of insects. And if we go back and do the calculations for the 40,000 bats that emerge out of that cave in Prieto Campanario, that entire colony can eat up to 440 pounds of insects each night. And that's really important because bats save over $4 billion a year in pest control for protecting agricultural crops and also for protecting human health. Bats as seed dispersers, we call them frugivores, and they're really important because they will help to regenerate forests, but they also help to um, provide food resources for humans. So they commonly will disperse seeds of avocado and dates, figs, and cashew. So as a bat is carrying their fruit, they're flying away. Sometimes I find a half-eaten piece of fruit where the seed is exposed and that'll take root very quickly. But other times after they've eaten it, well, guano happens. And so in order to help uh, disturbed areas uh, respond and provide a mechanism for secondary forest regeneration, um, when they pass through or pass their seeds through, they help to reforest and the cycle goes on and on. So they're really important for forest regeneration. Bats as pollinators, we call them nectivores, they're really, really important for food resources for us. We get bananas and peaches, cocoa, mango, durian, cloves, carob, balsa wood, that's just a few of them. And in Madagascar, where poverty is um, just everywhere, uh, the baobab tree is pollinated by numerous nectivore bats. And those people consider this tree the tree of life. It pretty much provides shade and water and juices and fruits. Uh, so this is a very important tree to them. And without those nectivores, these trees would not be there. So those of you who like tequila, you will know that bats are really important pollinators for blue agave. And in Mexico, the lesser Mexican long-nosed bat was listed as threatened in 1994, but has been delisted in since 2014, which is really good news but its status is totally dictated by the health of the agave. And so natural agave is, is not very common, but the agave growers, um, they uh, cut the flowers in order to uh, create tequila and mezcal before they go into flower and they don't give the bats a chance to pollinate. And so that's a problem for bats, but it's a bigger problem for blue agave. Because you're not getting cross-pollination by the bats, the blue agave, more than 40% of the Mexican blue agave are diseased and do not have enough genetic diversity to survive a blight. So Rodrigo Menelin, who is also known as the Batman of Mexico, he took it upon himself to go to the main 
uh, agave growers and uh, distributors of tequila and mezcal and created this bat-friendly project. And what he's convinced the five major growers to do is to put aside 5% of all of their blue agave plants and allow them to go into a flower so that the bats have food and that there's cross-pollination, which will increase the genetic diversity for blue agave throughout Mexico. It's super important because it's one of their main exports. And without it, uh, it could um, be a financial disaster for Mexico. So this is just one of the bat-friendly tequilas, Tequila Ocho, and there are five different brands. So if you drink tequila and you're in a restaurant, ask them if they serve bat-friendly tequila. If not, well, then you have a story to tell them. So some more reasons why we should care about bats. There's uh, 1,387 species as of last October and they are ecologically important to the health of natural ecosystems and global economies, as I just presented. They are keystone species, which means that without them, certain ecosystems could absolutely collapse. Their guano is super important, and when collected responsibly, can have a positive effect on, econ uh, on local economies and used as fertilizers. So, Guanomad is actually one of the main fertilizing companies in Madagascar. And then one of the other thing that's really interesting is that they're a huge tourist attraction. Uh, in Texas, you can visit the Constitution Bridge in Austin or go to Bracken Cave in San Antonio, Texas, and you can see thousands and thousands of um, Mexican free-tail bats. So, if I, you look over here to the right, this is actually taken from my phone. I downloaded uh, Radar Now, which is just an app. And because there's so many bats, they come up as a weather event on your phone. So it's pretty easy to track bats in Texas. Most importantly, they bring in over $10 million in tourism revenue every year. So bats are a great tourist attraction. There are some main threats to bats, mostly from human activities. The first one, of course, is habitat loss. And so the main drivers for habitat loss are commodity-driven deforestation, so for economics, wildfires, subsistence farming, urbanization, and forestry. Secondly, poverty and some misconceptions of disease contribute to uh, bats being threatened. So I'm going to bring you back very quickly to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014. And in poverty-stricken nations, when food is super scarce, scarce, bats are very easy to catch. And so they go out to trees like this or to uh, abandoned mines, and they will just catch them with, with nets, even fishing nets. And then they will take the wings off and they will skew them and cook them over uh, fire and bats carry Ebola. And so th there hasn't been consensus on, you know, where the Ebola virus originated, but there's thought that this, uh, this tree uh, was one of the areas where it started. And then there's another thought that an abandoned mine shaft in Liberia is where it started. But needless to say, poverty, driving people to capture bats because they're easy to get and easy protein and the misconceptions or no conception that bats are carrying disease uh, is driving some of the um, decrease or decline in their, their populations. Disease here in, in uh, the United States, especially in the Northeast, we're dealing with something called white nose syndrome. And it was first documented in New York in the winter of 2006 in Schoharie County, where thousands of little brown bats, which are shown here, had this white fungus around their nose, which is known as white nose syndrome. It's killed over 7 million bats in the Northeast US and Canada. And in some areas, 90 to 100% of the bats have died. And basically it came over on the boots of slunkers from Europe. The European bats are immune to it, but our bats were not. So their populations crashed. They, some of them are slowly on the rebound, but uh, it will take quite some time for that to happen. So there's Schoharie County, 
and you can see through the years how it has started to move further west, uh, even as far uh, north as Washington. And you can see it moving slowly into Texas, so where uh, Austin and San Antonio are um, could potentially impact those large populations, the largest population in the world of Mexican free-tailed bats. And also, uh, since October was detected in two more counties in Minnesota, spread to Texas, and has now been discovered in South Dakota. So we'll keep an eye on white nose syndrome. And then last, of course, is climate change. The IUCN Red List has a way of calculating potential extinction risk for bat communities. And bats are very specialized in the way that they feed. Uh, so um, some of the things that are grossly impacting their populations is increased precipitation in certain parts of the world, which is reducing their reproductive success and population size. And on the other hand, frequency in heat waves, such as Australia, where droughts, you've got thousands and thousands of these large um, uh, flying foxes just dropping to their death because the heat has been so extreme. And then extreme winter weather, which is something that uh, I'm seeing in South America, which is their summer, but our winter, um, which is causing, if it's too dry or too wet, it's causing fruit or flower not to occur when it normally should. So the bats are returning and there's no flowers for them to pollinate or there's no fruit for them to eat. So food availability, availability or lack of is contributing to their decline in population. So how do we study bats? We always have bioacoustical meters um, and so, or we call these song meters. So this is a bioacoustical meter, uh, kind of a sophisticated one, which is known as the SM3. Uh, and then this is the echo meter touch. This is the pro, or you can get pro two, and it hooks up to your phone or to a tablet, whether Android or um, uh, Apple. Uh, and then we also catch, catch them with nets. So um, the way that the bioacoustics works, is each bat has a very specific frequency that they send out, uh, especially the uh, insectivorous bats. All of the bats can send out a frequency, or most bats, not all, but most bats can send out a frequency whether they're insectivorous or not, but the insectivorous ones give us the, the best calls. And it's called a feeding buzz. And so you can see, let's just take myotis here, and you can see, or here, tenacia, let's take tenacia. So here you can see when they're searching, this is what the bat is doing, they're searching. This is the signature call at a specific frequency. Then they're catching their prey. So you can see the frequency starts to increase. And then as they're flying away, you can see the changes in each of these songs as we call it. So I was giving a presentation uh, at a brewery last June and I had these meters out where the people who were there were, were looking at them and so I'm just gonna, this is an Eastern red that just kept flying around. So this is what it sounds like coming from one of those echo meter, echo meter touches. So you can see the call, you can see the pattern. And when you turn up the volume, you can hear, hear what you cannot normally hear with, the, with, with your, your ear. So how do we catch bats with nets? That's a little bit more interesting. So that little girl that I showed you, who's my favorite field partner, this is my daughter all grown up. And so this is, she now assists me with my high school students in the Amazon. So this was taken a couple of years ago. Send me a buddy. It is a frugivore. So I got his feet out and I got his first wing out. Now I usually get, it's usually much, okay, I can turn my biting. So I kind of take my, my other hand to press him down so he doesn't turn around and bite me. Okay. It's a little dirty. Like holding his, like, his feet around. Yay. So I have six. This is a um, Corolia. It's Corolia persistilata. Uh -huh. Which is very, uh, this is also known as the short tailed fruit bat. Um, okay. So I'm going to have to leave this. So she's going to measure the forearm length. That's how we identify them. One of the characteristics. 
Oh, they're beautiful. On their way. students can get really excited uh, when they see bats but they get just as excited when they when they see the sonograms from the echo meter touches uh, we always have them out together and you know if you've never been trained to capture bats there are programs that you can sign up for and take your students to depending on where you are in the country uh, that do some bat captures so Bat Conservation International does some of those. There's, there's a whole bunch of different groups. You just have to look for them in your area. So using those song meters to teach about bats really captivates the audience. And um, I had it out on the side when, when Lexi was showing the kids the, the bats. But what's nice about it is that as the bats are coming overhead and it's picking up uh, a, a signature, uh, there is a library inside the meter, and so it pops up the bat type that you are seeing overhead. And they're pretty, they're pretty accurate. So if you go, you can click on a link and go to Echo Meter Touch to learn more about it. Um, but you can e use them very easily. And so I would recommend, there's also a little teeny 30 second video clip here that you can always look at, but if you go to um, their website, you can see how it's done. What's really cool about this application is if there's only money for one of these microphones, there is an application that you download on your phone or on a tablet. And so students and other teachers can download it as well, or if you're from a, a, a civic organization or an NGO, you download this application and the person who records this, say I recorded the, the, the bats from one evening, I can share all of the uh, wave files, all of the sound files with everybody who was there. And then on the application, you can bring it up and you'll get all of this information. So that's one of the really cool things. Uh, and the Pro is a little bit more uh, Echo uh, Touch Pro 2 and Pro are a little bit more expensive than just the Echo Meter. But they range, I think, from about $180 to maybe $350. And not everybody has money for that in a budget, but Wildlife Acoustics does have a financial assistance program. So they have a grant program that I just want to bring to your attention really quickly. Um, and if you go, they, they tell you about it. They give, uh, I think it's four different awards each year, um, but it'll tell you how it, how it works, when the deadlines are, and you can write a grant for up to $5,000. Now, what I would say is go through all of this, but the recipients, you should go into here where it says recipients and take a look at all the different projects. There's middle school projects in here, high school projects, college projects, NGOs, all kinds of different projects uh, and reasons why uh, they want to do this different research. And then um, the company does uh, review and, and makes those awards. So if you're thinking, oh, well, I may not be able to afford this, know that that's there. 
Okay, and so the next thing I'd like to just share with you is uh, I've been doing a project-based learning and citizen science project, which all started with middle school kids that I took out during Bat Week, which is sponsored by Bat Conservation International. And we went to this place in the town of Islip where, where Fayetteville is located. And this is an old estate, but it's run by SeaTuck Environmental. And what we did was we noticed that uh, that week, which we normally go across the street from the high school to a reserve, we always get lots of bats that third week of, of October. And we were like, all right, let's go to this place. It's got really good habitat. There's a stream, there's forest, there's edge habitat, all these great habitats for bats. And we got one pass of an Eastern rat. Everybody was like, what's going on? So I was talking to the president of SeaTuck that night afterwards. And he said, you know, they had just started spraying the day before for West Nile virus. They spray larvicides and adulticides everywhere on Long Island uh, from May through October. And so we had no bats because there was no food for the bats. So I decided to set up a project with this group and with some of the high school students and some students from a local um, a junior college. And we set the meters up on these high areas and then into the forest and over the stream. And so we did it for the entire spraying season. And we did find that the bat activity is significantly lower right after the spraying than when there's no spraying. So this is a project that we will now go to the county uh, with the evidence and it's a, you know, an NGO plus high school students and junior college students and teachers and professors all working together to better understand how we can protect um, these habitats and these bats. So some of the things that you can do, uh, support bat conservation groups. So Bat Conservation International is one that I keep mentioning. You can go to batcon.org. They have tons of curricula for teaching uh, uh, about bats. They have Bat Week activities at batweek.org. They have the most wonderful bat house design. So you can build um, bat, bat houses with your students. Uh, this year we uh, had built some bat houses. One of my students made these fun little bat uh, donuts for us. Uh, you can always purchase bat friendly tequila, of course not with your students. You can do the project uh, wild projects. And uh, we just created something called Bat Map Long Island, which is hosted by SeaTuck. It'll be on their website. It actually goes live next week. And um, I'll just bring it up for you. So I do geospatial science. Uh, there is something with Esri where you can use something called um, Survey123 and ArcGIS Online. You just create this little survey and it's asking about where the bats are, where people sitting in their backyard during the summer are seeing bats. Are they coming from the trees? Are they coming from, you know, up in the eaves? Record the zip code, choose the best description for the location and where they were flying because I can tell which bats they probably are. And then, you know, did you see them at dusk or was it later on? Because if they saw them at dusk, then that means that they're emerging from right in that area. And then, you know, how many individuals and would they actually allow me to contact them? Because if they do, and I have this information, I can start to tell where the bats are because this map will populate. And it's just an application that they download on their phone. And then I can go out there with the bioacoustical meters or the song meters and figure out who's in the neighborhood, which bats are in the neighborhood. And then if we have the northern long-eared, which is threatened here on Long Island, uh, we can set up nets and do something there. So that's just a, a cool little um, citizen science project that can turn out to be some student's master's project down the road if we get to the point where we're, we're monitoring with the bat libraries and with the um, with the nets. So uh, before I say thank you and goodbye, uh, I'm not going to play this, but this is an awesome video that shows uh, Bat Conservation International in Central Park using the echo meter touches to take uh, citizens out to learn about bats in Central Park. And um, I would just like to again say thank you. I look forward to your, um, your questions later on and uh, I will turn it back over to Elena. Thank you. 
Thanks, Maria. That was wonderful. I, I've learned so much about bats and I'm sure other people are learning some great things as well. And um, we, there are lots of great questions. So um, we ho hopefully we'll be able to get to them and um, chances are we probably will go a little over time. So if you can uh, stick around, that'd be great. If not, this is recorded and we'll be sure to get to all of your questions at the end. Um, so let's see, hoping you all can see my screen. Um, but I wanted to see, now that you know a little bit more about bats, um, I have another poll for you. Um, let's see, here we go. One question. Um, so after Maria's presentation, she did talk about the Echo Meter Touch 2. It does cost around $179. I just looked on their website. Um, is that cost a barrier to you using that technology in your education setting? And we'll be sure to give folks a few more seconds, maybe about 15 more seconds to respond. I will say that um, I, I have an echo meter touch too that I won in an auction at the North American Association for Environmental Education Conference recently. And I take it with me everywhere on all my work trips. And um, it's, it's so neat to see the different kinds of bats um, because where I live in the mid-Atlantic, we really don't get very many species of bats. So it's kind of nice to see um, what's around in different parts of the country. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the poll. And I'll share the results. And so, uh, Maria, you can see here that, you know, $179 can be a barrier for some organizations that... Um, uh, that might want to use this technology, but she did mention that there are some grants available um, in order to purchase that. So I think that's that's great. And and always, I would recommend contacting Wildlife Acoustics to see if they have um, any other kinds of grants available for you to purchase that if it's something that you want to use in an educational setting. Okay. So next, um, I'm going to introduce Jen Dennison. I can get the slide. Okay. Um, so Jen Dennison is the Wildlife Education Coordinator and Acting Information and Education Administrator for the Ohio DNR Division of Wildlife. Jen has been with the Division of Wildlife for over 21 years and in her current position for 18 years. She has a BS in Environmental Education, Communications, and Interpretations with a specialization in wildlife management from Ohio State University. And she's the State Project Wild Coordinator, ODNR Advisor to the Environmental Education Council of Ohio's Executive Board, the ODNR Representative to Ohio's EPA, Office of Environmental Education Funding Board, and a, net, a network regional leader for science for Ohio Department of Education. I just listed a few of the things that Jen <laughs> does currently. She, she does so much. I don't know where she has the energy, finds the time to do it all, but she does so much for the state of Ohio. Um, and she's worked in the field of EE for over 24 years in various education and leadership positions. So with that, um, Jen, I will turn it over to you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Uh, we started offering Wild About ever uh, at wildlife workshops probably about 20 years ago and they started off as a perk for our volunteers our facilitators to do project wild and they have quickly evolved into opening it up to any educator in Ohio that has an interest in wildlife and we had white nose syndrome show up in Ohio in the winter of 2011-2012 in response to that, we always try to make these workshops something relevant to a wildlife, a current wildlife issue. And since we had white nose show up in 2012, and by around 2014, we started offering these wild about bat workshops. And 
they were well, very well received. We ended up getting about 40 to 50 people in each one of, uh, each one of these workshops and we ended up holding three in 2014. Our only drawback is that we didn't actually have any live bats that we were able to bring to the workshops, but um, we ended up doing a lot of other things that ended up working pretty well. Um, if you transition to the next slide, we can look at the agenda. There we go. And what we tried to do, and what we always try to do in these uh, advanced workshops, is we try to have uh, someone in the field come in and do a talk about whatever the topic is. We try to get some field uh, experiences into the day as well. And then we always try to incorporate it into um, education in some form or another, whether, whether it's through actually doing some activities or providing a ton of resources. So you can see here, we had University of Akron uh, folks come in and give us some basic biology about bats. And we did a couple activities and then we talked about some local research that takes place around both the region that the uh, workshop took place, but then also across the state. And we um, also talked about survey techniques and we talked about solutions for exclusions. How do you keep bats out of your house? What are some of the current threats and obviously that was a, a white nose syndrome was a big part of that and then we also had tons of resources and prizes if you go to the next slide we uh, showed them how mist nets are used to capture bats we had that's greg smith that's the one lecture from the um, from the university of akron and he had some artifacts in hand that got passed around to showcase during the workshop. And then we took them outside and we did a couple some activities with them. You go to the next slide. We offered up a ton of resources. I'm gonna put in the chat box a couple of links to where you can find these resources online. The book that's in the picture is from the Ohio Biological Survey. and It's uh, available for purchase. And then we also have uh, we also have a field guide um, that we offer as a state. It's a mammal guide and it has tons of information about Ohio mammals as well. Next slide. And then we also started uh, producing through a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service a bat loaner trunk. And in that bat loaner trunk we have artifacts, we have activities, including the one in the middle is where students we, we created these little felt replica bats that weighed the same as an actual bat. And to identify the bat, you have to weigh it and measure the forearm. And using that information as, long, as well as some other clues on a card, you have to identify the bat species that's native to Ohio that you might have in your hand in a, in a fictional survey. And then we also have on the right-hand picture uh, our dress a bat where different adaptations are added to some poor victim to uh, showcase the different adaptations that bats have. Go to the next slide. So that's really quickly what we have done here in Ohio and we continue to plan on um, uh, offering additional workshops on bats and other uh, Project Wild related and wildlife related activities. We've got some great resources and I will post that in the chat box and I will stick around for any questions you might have at the end. All right. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, um, I love that person in the, in the <laughs> bat costume. You know, if, if, um, if any of you ever have a chance to attend a Project Wild workshop, I highly encourage it. There's always lots of fun and laughs going on in every workshop for sure. Okay. Uh, so our next presenter is Lori Adams. Uh, Lori Adams is the Idaho Project Wild Coordinator and Aquatic Education Coordinator, and she's been in the teaching field for nearly 30 years. 12 of those years in a traditional classroom setting and 17 in her current position at the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Um, after this webinar, uh, check out the great video her department, um, her department made about uh, her Wild About Bats workshop. And I think I posted that in the social media. Um, so, Lori, thank you so much.
Oh, Laura, you might need to unmute yourself. Hi, thanks for having me. Super Great. excited to be here. Um, um, just wanted to um, give a shout out to all the people at Idaho Department of Fish and Game because once I started putting all this together, I was like, we have a lot of really great stuff. And the gal that I work with on the workshop, Jennifer Jackson, has a master's in bat biology. So I felt really fortunate to have that. I was able to take all that she knew and connect it with the teachers and, and that stuff. So thank you. Um, anyhow, um, I think we were going to show the PowerPoint there. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you see it, Lori? Um, let's see. Screen share. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So um, the, the first one was just the intro slide. Um, I just wanted to take a second to talk about, we do have a lot, of, like Jen said, a lot of other specialized wilds. Um, and we didn't do our first bat one until 2015. And then it's an every other year program that we do. And in Idaho, our workshops are 15 hours in length and the teachers get the um, professional development credit and that sort of thing. So um, there's a lot of fun little specialized we do. We usually have the first day of class where we get the background inf information. And for the bats, we were out you know, till like 11.30 at night, miss netting. And then the second day was just more classwork um, and, you know, all kinds of activities. One thing I did want to do too is one of the things I found really good luck with is giving them like the little memorabilia type thing. And, and these, um, you can see the, the bat thing in the top and I'll talk about those in a second and I have all the directions for that. But some of them are dirt cheap, like the wild about salmon rock, you know, and that's a great, way to get teachers to go hey what's your doorstop well it, i took this class this summer called wild about salmon and you know it, it's just great advertising pretty cheap <laughs> so um next slide oh i wanted to say too on that um on that slide is the um what to do if you have a bat in your home and again a, our fishing game people are fantastic and they did a great video to show people how to get a bat out without harming it Okay, next slide. So this was day one of our classroom activities and um, you can see, you know, you always wanna have your books and all that kind of stuff. We, we have a biologist come in and that's Jenny in the bat scarf there talking about um, bats and kind of just the same sort of thing that Maria just did. Um, we did dichotomous keys. We um, took the Project Wild, um, Flying Wild activity um, Great Migration Challenge and made it for bats. So all the things that bats face and you can see the teachers doing their little, their little things there. So that was fun. And then the next slide, I think, go ahead, Alina, is um, our, our mist netting. And we got out there, you know, before it was getting dark and um, you can see them setting up the slide or the, not the slide, but the mist net and you know, the teachers didn't handle the bats, but we were definitely right there being able to take pictures of them. And it was just super fun. But I know the first year we did it, we went to an area where um, Jenny thought that there would be bats and we didn't get bats. And it was sort of disappointing. We heard them all around, but we didn't catch any. But then this next night we caught all kinds of, this was two years later, all kinds of the little brown mostly, I think was what we had. So super fun. And then the next slide is um, on day two. Again, we had a late start because we were there so late and we had, you know, bat related breakfast things. And then um, we spend a lot of time just kind of getting, getting teachers, showing them ways to get kids excited about bats. Um, again, there you can see the stained glass window in the middle and um, that's just with the 99 cent or a dollar store frame. And, uh, you know, I have all the directions on our share file. Um, we play Bat Jeopardy, do art projects. And another um, activity that we did, um, actually it came from a Project Wild 2 class way back before my time. Somebody wrote an activity called Fat Bat Habitat. And it talks about limiting factors and, um, um, you know, man-made and natural limiting factors that are bats, bats, face and they have to go around and they collect all these mosquitoes. So be sure to um, check out Fat Bat Habitat. Um, super fun. And then um, again, just we have the bat trunks. There's a picture there of what kinds of things are in the bat trunks. And 
I believe we have four back trunks and in October, it's hard to get them. People are, you know, lining up trying to get them to check out for a week. So that was that. And then I just, um, you know, I'll, I'll be here to ask it for any questions. Um, but I don't know now, Elena, could we show the face of the conservation video? But for Rebecca, this was one of our video people that came in to our wild bats class and talked to one of our teachers. So just love this. Okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't hear any sound. Do you all hear sound? Uh -oh. I don't either. On mute. Mute. Oh. Shoot. Well, this was unexpected. Sorry about that. It worked earlier. Um, well, this is, the video is called The Face of a Conservationist, right, Lori? Yes. And it features an educator that has done several wild about workshops uh, with Lori in Idaho. And we'll be sure, sure to post the link <laughs> and um, okay. this show uh, so people can have access to this. But the, the educator, um, she says some really great things about, you know, why she's participated in these workshops and, um, and how it's benefited her students. So it, it really was a nice video. <laughs> Sorry about yeah. that. It's, I'm sorry, I should have, yeah, it's it's fine. But yeah, do take the time to check that one out. Um, also the, the Wild About Bats one that the link was on the my intro page, um, Elena put it on there, because it really showed how all the logistics that go into setting up, um, you know, for the mist netting. And of course we have to, similar to everybody else, you know, now there kind of has to be a reason. You can't just say, hey, let's go miss that bats. You know, the biologists have to, we have to work with them and work on dates and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but it really, it really draws the teachers. So super fun. Okay. So, um, so we're, we are over time and I'm so sorry that, um, you know, people have to go, but if you can stick around, we do have, um, a little bit more plus we'll we'll be answering some or our presenters will answer some questions I do have a couple questions of you first so question number one did you learn something about bat biology or ecology on this webinar and question number two do you think you will use some of what you learned to teach about bats and while you all are responding to this poll, I will, I will encourage you perhaps to start putting together your own bat trunk <laughs> or your own bat resources now so you're ready to go in October. It might take you a while to collect some of these things. Um, but I, I see some great opportunities to incorporate um, teaching about bats into so many different parts of um, what we teach on a regular basis. So I'm going to, it looks like most people have responded. So I'll end the poll and share the results so you all can see. So um, looks like a good number of people learned something. Um, and some of you already knew a whole lot about bats, which is great. Um, and oh, it looks like a lot of you will be able to use some of what you learned um, in today's webinar to teach about that. So that's great. That's what this is all about. So um, now, Elena, did, did yes. we, are you going to send the share file link or how, because I don't think we gave that to everybody, the, the one that has like the fat bat habitat and the directions for the stained glass window and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, we can post all of those resources on that web page and um, what, uh, <clears throat> what we'll do is just on, we'll send out an email to everybody either tomorrow or the next day um, and they'll have a direct link to the website that will have all those resources. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now it's, it's your turn. We do have a lot of questions. Um, Mar Maria, I think the first one is for you. Um, this question was from Amanda, and she would like to know the difference between old and new world bats. 
Um, is it just a geography thing or is it size that distinguishes the between t the two? So the old world bats are uh, most of the bats that you'll see in Asia, um, you know, uh, Indonesia. So they are the flying foxes and um, those larger bats. The new world bats are the smaller bats uh, that we see South America, Central America, United States, North America. Uh, so yeah, that's the difference. Thank you. Um, Katie would like to know, um, which species of bats consume mosquitoes on a regular basis? She might want to know this like for her own personal backyard issues. <laughs> Where is Katie from? Um, she didn't say. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess, you know, depending on where you're from, we do have big brown bats throughout all of North America. We have little brown bats uh, in declining numbers, but again, um, all of North America pretty much. So they are insectivorous. Um, there are other species that come to visit from other places, just depending on where you are. You know, that's why I had to ask where she is. So I'm trying to think of some that are just kind of, we see them all across North America, whether it be um, Canada, US or Mexico, um, but big browns, definitely. Eastern reds, definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Jamie would like to know, are any of those fruit trees exclusively pollinated by bats? Like the banana trees, are they only pollinated by bats or do other species pollinate them as well? So that's a really good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. And I guess it would depend on where you are uh, in the world and where banana is being grown. Uh, because there's all different types of banana. Uh, well, they're not they're not trees. They're 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 really herbaceous. Um, but I think it depends where in the world you are. Uh, there are some very specific bats that will just like the the uh, the ones that pollinate the blue agave uh, are the only bats that pollinate that. But as far as I, it really depends where you are. So I'm not really sure how to answer that because regionally it, it would change. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, uh, there are two questions related to the agave plant. I, people are very concerned about tequila, which is a legitimate <laughs> concern. Um, so one question what, from Dorian was, why weren't they allowing the agave plants to flower? And then related to that is, can the farmers rotate the crops, leaving some agave to flower? So on the first note, in the, in the way to maximize the, their yield for production of uh, tequila, they have to actually harvest the plant before it goes into flower. Uh, so that's why they're not letting them go into flower. Um, and could they rotate their crop? They could, but it might be, I don't know if it would be that advantageous for them to do that because I don't know how well the agave will take once you start to uproot it and re and try and transplant it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. or are they saying rotating the crop as far as um, as far as just letting some of it go into flower and, and letting some of it not flower. Probably that. That's probably what they're referring to instead of transplanting. Um, so they probably could, but I think it's easier for them to have an area set aside geographically because they have, you know, thousands of acres of agave. And if they just have one, one area set aside, then they'll get the cross pollination. But they may be doing it. They may be doing parts, you know, in different sections. I'm not really sure because it's five different major companies, and I'm not entirely sure what their process is. But I do know that five percent of it is being left 
for it to go into flower, before harvesting for tequila. Okay, thanks. Um, Jean would like to know, how does the percentage of bats with rabies compare with other mammals, um, particularly, particularly those that are considered rabies vectors? So extremely low. Um, again, you know, here on Long Island, if we look at, you know, number of raccoons that could potentially have rabies, number of fox that could potentially have rabies, it's far greater, probably 60 or 70 percent higher than what you would find in a bat. Uh, again, in all bat species combined, it's less than 1% of those bats that have been found to carry rabies. Okay. Um, Dorian would like to know, is there any health risk for humans visiting these bat caves, like with all the tourism going on, ecotourism, and how do they prevent humans from bringing um, issues to the bats? So one, yes, it's very dangerous to go into bat caves, uh, especially when you've got thousands of bats that are roosting in a cave. Uh, the guano alone has all types of bacteria. Uh, bat caves themselves can get to extremely high temperatures and the carbon dioxide and oxygen levels can be extreme. So not recommended to go into bat caves without somebody who, uh, first of all, knows what they're doing. And secondly, you know, at least in New York State, and I think in many places in the Northeast, you now have to have um, some sort of permission to enter a cave because we could be bringing things in our boots or on our boots that we don't know that we're bringing in the same way that the spelunkers were thought to have brought white nose syndrome over. And it was basically just because they didn't know. And, and it's also thought that as people, you know, some of the agency personnel, as they started to go in to figure out why are all these bats dying, we have to clean them up. It didn't occur to them initially to kind of go through a protocol of cleansing their feet initially. And so they may have gone in the very beginning into one cave that was contaminated and then transported it into another cave. So, you know, um, cave exploring is awesome and everybody should be an explorer. Uh, but again, you know, find out if there are permissions that are needed to be had before going into these habitats. And um, also not recommended to go into many caves that have lots of bats without a respirator, without the right, you know, when we, I, I've actually gone down into caves where I've repelled and I've had full respirators and full Tyvek gear on because uh, it's just not healthy. Um, and Maria, Matt wants to know, are little brown bats the only ones that are affected by white nose syndrome? Uh, no. Uh, in, in New York State, uh, so many of uh, the bats have been impacted by uh, white nose syndrome. So little browns, big browns. The northern long-eared uh, used to be ubiquitous throughout New York State. And since 2011, the only place in all of New York State where we know we have healthy populations are here on Long Island. And that's because we're sand and gravel. We have no bedrock. We have no caves. Um, uh, also, the Indiana bat. Uh, there's, there's so many bats that have been impacted, but the little brown seems to have been hit the hardest, at least in this region. Okay, thanks. Um, this is one I haven't heard before. So Jody says that it's been pretty cold there in South Texas and the bats are starting to get into schools, I guess to stay warm, and the schools are spraying peppermint to get them out. And Jody wants to know, is this a safe, effective way to remove them? And then what are the consequences of removing the bats during the colder months? Huh. <laughs> I'm not really sure how to answer that question. So <laughs> Texas, I mean, there are bats that are migratory. And so some of the bats will start to return to Texas within the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm not sure who's microphone. Um, OK, 
Okay, I muted myself for a second to see if that would help. Uh, no, I think I got it. Okay. Um, so, you know, we've had a lot of bats here stirring because we've had very weird warm days in New York. And so moths have been out in December and January and have seen Eastern reds come out and have been feeding, but a lot of them have fallen to their death. Um, I don't really know how to respond to the question in Texas because I don't know the, te the bats from that region that well. Again, some of them are going to start migrating in, so it might be part of the normal migration and not necessarily related to the cold, or maybe they are trying to get into the buildings to stay warm. Peppermint, I don't think, is going to bother them. I don't know how effective that will be. That is a first for me. I've never heard that before. Usually, if we have a bat, we'll take a hand net, like a, like a dip net, and just get the bat with a dip net and have a, have a good glove on, close it off, and then bring it outside and release it. Yeah, I've always thought, uh, we've just turned off the lights, make sure that all the lights are off, open up a door, and usually it finds its way out. Yeah. Or just, hey, have a whole school bat learning lesson. <laughs> That's what I would do. Teachable moment. <laughs> yep. um, Okay, well, thank you all so much. I just have one last announcement and I would like to congratulate uh, Jody Reyna, who is the lucky recipient of a new Echo Meter Touch 2 from Wildlife Acoustics. And then um, Matt Smetana is the lucky recipient of a free Flying Wild Guide from Project Wild. So congratulations to the two of you and thank you for registering for this webinar early on. <laughs> um, all right, I would like to take one last opportunity to thank all of our guest speakers, Maria, Jen, and Lori. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise and all the resources that you're sharing with folks to get um, education about bats out there and available. Thank you all so much. And um, our next webinar will be in April on insects. So you might, you'll learn how to build an insect house, which will be so cool, which will attract more bats, by the way. <laughs> All right, so thanks everyone. I appreciate it and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. -bye.